The scripture reading for today is from Acts chapter 6, going to read from verse 8 to 15, and also from chapter 7, verse 51 to 60. Acts 6, verse 8. Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. But one day, some men from the synagogue of freed slaves, as it was called, started to debate with him. They were Jews from Cyrene, Alexandria, Cilicia, and the province of Asia. None of them could stand against the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen spoke. So they persuaded some men to lie about Stephen, saying, We heard him blaspheme Moses and even God. This roused the people, the elders, and the teachers of religious law. So they arrested Stephen and brought him before the high council. The lying witnesses said, This man is always speaking against the holy temple and against the law of Moses. We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazarene will destroy, uh, sorry, Jesus of Nazareth will destroy the temple and change the customs Moses handed down to us. At this point, everyone in the high council stared at Stephen because his face became as bright as an angel's. Then the high priest asked Stephen, Are these accusations true? This was Stephen's reply. Brothers and fathers, listen to me. Our glorious God appeared to our ancestor Abraham in Mesopotamia before he settled in Haran. Now I'm going to skip down to chapter 7, verse 51. Stephen is concluding his uh, long message that he's been giving to these guys. He says, You stubborn people, you are heathen at heart and deaf to the truth. Must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did, and so do you. Name one prophet whom your ancestors didn't persecute. They even killed the righteous ones who predicted the coming of the righteous one. Oh, sorry. They even killed the ones who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah whom you betrayed and murdered. You deliberately disobeyed God's law, even though you received it from the hands of angels. The Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusation, and they shook their fists at him in rage. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. And he told them, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of, God, Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Then they put their hands over their ears and began shouting. They rushed at him and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. As they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. If you follow baseball, you will know this name. Um, I don't know if I'm saying it right or not, but uh, uh, Shohei Otani. He is a Japanese baseball player. He's a very rare combination of an extraordinary pitcher and an extraordinary hitter. He was signed in December with the Los Angeles Dodgers for $700 million over 10 years. That makes him the highest paid athlete in the world. Probably a very extraordinary person, or they wouldn't pay him that kind of money. In Acts 6, 1 to 7, we're into, we were introduced last week to Stephen, someone who we might also think is an extraordinary person, somebody that we couldn't ever be like. He seems to be very extra gifted. But we're going to see today that we all have what Stephen had, all of us do. Maybe not the same giftings as him, but if you were a follower of Jesus, uh, we have more than enough. We have Jesus himself. Stephen was mentioned first of the seven men that were chosen by the congregation in Acts 6, 1-7 to take care of the Greek-speaking widows, making sure that they had enough food. He in particular was commented on as someone who was full. Acts 6, verse 5. Everyone liked the idea and they chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Full of faith in the Holy Spirit. These qualities stood out in him. He was not a halfway follower of Jesus. He was all in and it showed and he lived it. He was one of seven who the congregation chose to serve by helping to look after widows. 
Now we come back to him in our section for today in Acts 6, 8. Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. So again, we see that full, full of God's grace and power. How full? He was doing miracles, it says. Uh, it says amazing miracles. And he wasn't even an apostle. This guy was something. He was also speaking powerfully of Jesus as we come to the next verse, verse 9. But one day, some men from the synagogue of freed slaves, as it was called, started to debate with him. They were Jews from Cyrene, Alexandria, Cilicia, and the province of Asia. Now, a synagogue is basically a Jewish meeting hall used for lots of purposes, including religious meetings. And there were many synagogues in Jerusalem because, of course, it was the spiritual center of Israel with the, the temple there. This particular synagogue had a chain of them actually around the Mediterranean. It was formed by Jews who had been liberated from, uh, from slavery to the Romans. They used to be slaves. But apparently these synagogues had been found in all those places that were mentioned there. Cyrene and Alexander were actually in Africa, which is to the uh, southwest of the nation of Israel. Cilicia and Asia are in the northwest in what is now presently Turkey. These guys would have been Greek-speaking Jews, the same as Stephen was. So it says there that uh, they had a debate with him. How did that go? Well, went pretty good for Stephen, but not so good for the other men. So they falsely accused him. Verse 10. None of them could stand against the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen spoke. So they persuaded some men to lie about Stephen, saying, We heard him blaspheme Moses and even God. Notice that they couldn't stand against Stephen's wisdom and the spirit which he spoke. He wasn't speaking in an angry or a derogatory way at all. He presented the information with grace of the Holy Spirit. But they were not honestly seeking the truth. And when they couldn't answer Stephen, they became jealous. So they lied and they brought false accusations in order to get Stephen into trouble. The exact same thing that actually happened to Jesus. Matthew 26, 59. It says the leading priests and the entire high council were trying to find witnesses who would lie about Jesus so they could put him to death. Jesus said that if people would persecute him, the son of God, they would certainly persecute his followers. And we actually see many parallels between Stephen and Jesus um, as we go along here. Jesus forewarned about what was happening to Stephen and what he was experiencing. He forewarned his disciples that this was going to be happening. Luke 21, 12 says, But before all this occurs, there will be a time of great persecution. You will be dragged into synagogues and prisons, and you will stand trial before kings and governors because you are my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. So don't worry in advance how, you, how to answer the charges against you. For I will give you the right words and such wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to reply or refute you. So what Jesus is saying here was not just to the apostles. He was speaking it to them, but also to any of his followers who would be experiencing this kind of opposition. As gifted as Stephen was, this promise of giving him the right words and wisdom is for him, but it's for anyone in this kind of situation, including us. When you find yourself in an opportunity to tell someone about Jesus, pray, pray, ask him for that wisdom. Trust Jesus to give you the words and the wisdom to answer well. I've experienced God helping me that way myself a good number of times. Let the knowledge of Jesus's presence with you give you the boldness to speak and trust yourself to him. Well, trouble does come because of the false accusations in verse 12. This roused the people, the elders, and the leaders of the religious, of religious law, teachers of religious law, sorry. So they arrested Stephen and brought him before the high council. The lying witnesses said, This man is always speaking against the holy temple and against the law of Moses. We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy the temple and change the customs Moses handed down to us. These are very similar accusations, actually, that were brought against Jesus. It boils down to accusing Stephen of blasphemy, which is pur blasphemy is purposely saying something wrong and misleading about God. 
Notice in verse 11 and in verse 13, these accusations that the people brought were purposely lies. They were formulated to get Stephen into trouble. Now, is he worried about it? Look at verse 16. At this point, everyone in the high council stared at Stephen because his face became as bright as an angel's. Wow, now that's pretty unique. It seems God is giving a visible sign that he is vindicating Stephen before his accusers. How cool is that? God is not abandoning him in any way. Stephen has entrusted himself to God, and God is with him. Jesus made a promise to his disciples and all of his followers in Matthew 28, verse 20. He says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, we ourselves are a lot closer to the end of the age than these guys were. This promise that he, that he will always be with us is to us as well when we entrust ourselves to Jesus. So Stephen is now given the opportunity to speak for himself in chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. The high priest asked Stephen, Are these accusations true? This was Stephen's reply. Brothers and fathers, listen to me. Our glorious God appeared to our ancestor Abraham in Mesopotamia before he settled in Haran. Now, that's just the start. He's going all the way down to uh, verse 50. And I'm just going to sum up what he says in that section. Basically, Stephen is now systematically going to show that the accusations these guys were bringing against him are completely untrue. He goes back into the nation's history, recalling foundational things with Abraham, with Moses, and with David, showing that he respects all of it. He respects Moses and the laws, the temple, the traditions, all those things. But at the same time, he's going to zero in on Jesus. He's going to show them their own unbelief and rejection of the truth. Now, next week, no, the next message I give, I'll be going over that, uh, the actual content of what he gives here. Now, Stephen made the case that he's not guilty of speaking against or disrespecting Moses or the law or the temple. In his final conclusion, as he wraps up all that stuff in verse 51, he turns things around a little bit. He becomes the accuser. Verse 51. He says, You stubborn people, you are heathen at heart and deaf to the truth. Must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did, and so do you. Name one prophet your ancestors didn't persecute. They even killed the ones who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah whom you betrayed and murdered. You deliberately disobeyed God's law, even though you received it from the hands of angels. Now, these people had disobeyed God's law and blasphemed when they murdered Jesus. Like it or not, these people needed to hear the truth so that they could recognize their sin, so that they could turn from it and recognize Jesus as their Messiah. I'm sure that Stephen knew that they weren't going to like what he said, and of course, they didn't. They were infuriated, as verse 54 says. The Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusation, and they shook their fists at him in rage. Yeah, they were pretty worked up, to say the least. What happens next, though, is very encouraging for Stephen, but it doesn't calm down the leaders any. Verse 55. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. And he told them, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. I mean, think about it. Wow, the Holy Spirit lets Stephen see right into heaven to the throne of God. He sees Jesus standing at the place of honor at God's right hand. It's such an awesome experience in spite of these guys that were in front of him all mad at him. He just tells them what he was seeing. Stephen uses a title here, the Son of Man, to refer to Jesus. This is actually very, very significant, as the title um, and the setting of Jesus being in, at the throne of God uh, would take Stephen and his listeners to a passage from Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14, a prophecy. It says this, And my vision continued that night. I saw someone like a Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient One and was led into His presence. He was given authority, honor, and sovereignty over all the nations of the world. 
so that the people of every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. Now this refers to none other than the eternal king, the one who would sit on David's throne forever with all authority over everyone who ever lived. This is the Messiah. Jesus often used this term for himself when he was ministering on earth, the son of man. And this is him. Uh, these leaders would know exactly what Stephen was saying, that he was saying, Jesus is this person. He is the Messiah. Now, Stephen also sees Jesus standing, not sitting. There's a number of verses which talk about Jesus ascending to heaven and sitting at the place of honor at God's right hand, such as Mark 16, 19. There's a, quite a number of them. So to see Jesus standing, and this is the only place we actually see this, um, is significant in a number of ways. So the first one, Jesus standing, is an active Jesus. He's involved and concerned in what's happening to Stephen. And seeing him would be very reassuring to Stephen at this very difficult time. In addition, it may also signify that Jesus is standing as Stephen's defender against his accusers. As the king, Jesus is also the judge who will vindicate Stephen, but will also condemn these other people. Jesus' standing may also show that he is welcoming Stephen into his presence very shortly. All of that would be hugely encouraging to Stephen for to see that vision. It should also be encouraging to us. The New Testament calls Jesus our advocate, our defender. He's for us. He's not against us. He defends his people against all accusations, even Satan's accusations, when we do something wrong, which we do pretty often. Romans 8, 34 says, Who then will condemn us? No one. For, Jesus, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. When anybody turns from their sins and puts their trust in Jesus, we are forgiven our sins. But very importantly, we are also given the righteousness of Jesus himself. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, God treated Jesus like he had lived our life, our sinful life, even though he was perfectly innocent. Jesus paid the penalty for our sin, death on the cross for us in our place. When we turn from our sin and put our trust in Jesus, God then treats us like we had lived Jesus' perfect life. We are made God's children and given the gift of the Holy Spirit, just like Stephen was. We are given even Jesus' righteousness. We're, like I said, treated like we lived Jesus' life. We call that the, the big trade, really. Very unfair trade, but that's what Jesus did. The Holy Spirit, once we become God's children, then works in us to change our lives and make us more like Jesus every day. We have a long way to go in our lives, as we all know, to become like Jesus. I'm a long way from that. We often sin and don't live like God would like us to. And when we sin, the Bible says that Satan accuses us before the Father. We see a number of instances of that happening to uh, other people in the Bible. And Satan is actually called the accuser of the brethren in Revelation 12.10. Uh, but because we belong to God through faith in Jesus, Jesus defends us. He defends all of us who belong to him. In this case, Stephen could see Jesus uh, standing for him and take comfort in that. The point, the point is that Jesus does the same thing for us. When we are going through any hard times, hard things, Jesus is with us. He may not take away what's going on, but he will be with us through those things. In the case of Stephen, Jesus does not actually rescue him. But Stephen knows that Jesus is with him as the leaders react in anger to what he was saying in verse 57. Then they put their hands over the ears and began shouting, they rushed at him and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. 
Needless to say, they totally lost it when they heard Stephen talking about Jesus at God's right hand. For them, that was ultimate blasphemy. But it was actually they themselves who were in error for rejecting Jesus. They resort at this point to mob violence and they stone Stephen. What that means, stoning, is that the whole crowd would pick up stones and throw them at Stephen until they killed him. It's not a nice way to die. This form of execution was reserved as a kind of a religious execution, as a way to show the severity of whatever the crime was that was committed. But Jesus is with Stephen in his final moments. Stephen commits himself to Jesus in verse 59. They stoned him, sorry, as they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Receive my spirit. Stephen knows he's going to die, and he entrusts himself to the one who died for him, to Jesus. Jesus said actually the same thing when he died on the cross. In Luke 23, 46, Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. Now for Stephen, entrusting himself to Jesus didn't start right there with, being, with death being so near to him. Entrusting ourselves to God, committing our lives to Jesus, comes when we first put our trust in Jesus. We can and should entrust ourselves to Jesus every single day. When we entrust ourselves to God, we accept what he sends our way, even hard stuff. Stephen was accepting what was coming his way, what God was allowing uh, these guys to stone him. We are bought with a price by Jesus. He paid the price of his life for us. That means we belong to God and he has the right to do what he wants in our lives. We give him that right, that privilege. But because he's loving, we know that he, that, uh, he will do with us what is best for his purposes and his glory. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 say, Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and who was given you, to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. He bought you with a high price, with the blood of Jesus, in fact. The context here in Corinthians is actually sexual sin. But it can be applied broadly um, to the fact that we belong to God and our goal in life is to please Him with all that we do in our lives, which also means we submit to God for Him, for him to use us in whatever way He wants, for whatever brings Him glory, even allowing our lives to be taken. Mark eight thirty four. Jesus said this, then, calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. Jesus wants us to give up our lives for him. That may mean literally giving it up like Stephen was doing as we're in our, uh, in our um, section today. It most certainly also means giving up our own desires and our ambitions for what Jesus would want for us in our daily lives, which is always going to be way, way better than what we want for ourselves. Stephen is committed to Jesus no matter what happens. Jesus obviously lets what happens happen to Stephen. Jesus was there. Stephen stayed true to him. Stephen committed his spirit, his life to Jesus. It was now time for Stephen to go home to be with Jesus. Stephen dies. It seems like such a waste. He was so talented. We think that God could have used him in such great ways when you think of all the talents that God gave him. But God did what was best. Listen to Stephen's last words, verse 60. He fell to his knees, shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. Stephen forgives his attackers and prays for them. 
He loved his opponents. He didn't want them to be judged. He wanted them to be saved. He was following Jesus' example, who prayed for his executioners as well. In Luke 23, verse 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. I mean, God would have rightly brought, could have rightly brought immediate judgment on those who executed Jesus for what they were doing, as well as for those who were executing Stephen. And it would have been rightly deserved, of course. But the purpose for Jesus dying was to save the lives, even of those who presently hated him, and even now of those who hated Stephen. That's God's incredible mercy. They're not getting what's deserved. There was at least one person that we know of who was present at Stephen's execution that this was going to make a very big difference to. That guy by the name of Saul, the young man who witnessed the execution. Saul heard the truth of Jesus. He didn't believe it at the time, but he eventually will. The truth of Jesus would one day make sense to him, and he's going to go, oh, what he said was true. We're going to see this later in the book of Acts. And he personally heard it from Stephen. In the meantime, there was another direct result of Stephen's death, uh, because intense persecution against the believers in Jerusalem, Jerusalem broke out immediately afterward. With that persecution, the followers of Jesus fled Jerusalem and scattered all over Israel. The gospel was also being spread along with those people into the rest of the country, into Judea and Samaria. Jesus made a command in Acts 1.8, and now this command and purpose was being fulfilled. It says there, but you will receive, this is what Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, which they've been doing, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The good news of Jesus moved out along with the people from Jerusalem into the rest of the country, and eventually well beyond it. And it all ends. Right now, it was because of Stephen's death and the resulting persecution which spread the people and the gospel message um, out into the rest of the country. In addition to that, millions of people have read this account of Stephen in the book of Acts and have been encouraged to be faithful to Jesus as they suffer persecution. Persecution of Christians is an all-time high all around the world. For those of us not facing persecution, Stephen's life and death is an encouragement still to be faithful in our own lives. It's an encouragement to be speaking of Jesus to others. And it's encouragement as to how we would live our lives committed to Jesus. We wonder, of course, what Stephen might have accomplished for God if he hadn't died at that point in his life. He was such a talented, gifted person. We think about how he would have done so much, but we have to realize and remember that we have the same God, the same resources, the same hope that Stephen did as well. He didn't do what he did in his own strength, all those things, but because he had the Holy Spirit and that he followed God with his whole heart, soul, and mind, that's why he did what he did. And we are called to do the same thing. Jesus was not only Stephen's advocate, he is our advocate. He defends us, he keeps us. We can commit our life to Jesus to follow him every day in whatever he brings to us as well. The point of being a follower of Jesus is not how long we live, but how well we live for Jesus. Stephen used what God gave him. God gave him opportunities to uh, serve, opportunities to speak, and he used them. God has also gifted every one of us who follow him in unique ways. Are you using what God gave you to follow him? Are you entrusting your life to him in every way, in every single day? For Stephen, following Jesus cost him his physical life. It doesn't cost us all in the same way but it easily could. Costing our lives doesn't necessarily mean physical death, but it will mean death to our wishes, our desires, and our goals 
in order to do what Jesus wants from us in our lives. Following Jesus always costs us everything, but it's worth it. We get Jesus. Stephen was welcomed by Jesus into eternity, into his presence. I want to hear from Jesus. Well done, you good and faithful servant. That's all that's going to matter for eternity is to hear that. There were some very surprising results from Stephen's death that God brought about in his sovereignty. God used Stephen's life and death for his glory because Stephen entrusted himself to God, to Jesus. How might God use you? How might God use you if you entrust yourself to him completely every day? You never know, but it's be well worth finding out.